Church family, join me today in 1 Timothy chapter 6. It is our last sermon in 1 Timothy. We'll be moving to 2 Timothy next Sunday morning in our sermon series simply called Order in the Church. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. Follow along as I read. I hope you have a copy of God's Word in front of you. If not, the words are on the screen, but the screen are a supplement, not a replacement for you carrying your Bible. Amen. Amen. There's a blessing to having your Bible with you. Amen. It says this verse 17, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. May God bless the uh, hearing of the Word and now the preaching of the Word as we conclude 1 Timothy chapter 6. Hey, the late comedian Jack Benny often quoted uh, and joked about his miserly love for money. In one skit, he was walking alone when a robber accosted him with a firearm. The robber, would-be robber, placed that gun in, in the face of Jack Benny and said, your money or your life. In the skit, there was a long pause with Jack saying nothing. The robber eventually impatiently said, well, Jack replied, don't rush me, I'm thinking about it. All right. So can we understand that money is something that's valuable to all of us? We all tend to make sacrifices for money. Sometimes we have a good view, a right view of money, and sometimes a wrong view of money. Apparently inside of this church in Ephesus that Paul was writing to Timothy to pastor, they had many skewed views of their material possessions, that their wealth became a, an idol, a god, a misused possession by God. They began, no doubt, to use money and their wealth as a god instead of as a servant. So Paul routinely and repeatedly spoke to Timothy to speak to the church about how to be godly in their financial wealth. This was not something alien to Scripture. Jesus spoke much about this topic as well. It said that Jesus spoke more about money and money management and stewardship than he even spoke about heaven and hell. That's a big statement. We in the church of, uh, of Jesus Christ, here at the Mission Church, we want to make sure that we're not over-belaboring the point. We also want to be faithful in teaching good stewardship because it's a matter of lordship and it's a matter of discipleship. Jesus says that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. The way that we view money, the way that we earn money, the way we give money shows where we are spiritually and where we are with Christ. So here Paul repeats some truths about finances. So we too are going to touch on this truth as we preach expositorily through this important book of the Bible. The sermon title for today is Money Management is a Christian Thing to Do. Now, I did not promote that widely before today. If I had, some of you would have showed up. Amen. <laughs> Many of you watching from home today would have tuned in today. But I can assure you, based on the authority of God's Word, this is a needed and a necessary thing for all of us. Now, Paul, even in this chapter, verses 5 through 10, he spoke 
about money then as well. So two times in this one chapter, Paul is speaking about wisdom of financial Christian management. In verses 5 through 10, Paul was speaking about people who had a desire to be rich. They were not yet rich, but they desired to be rich, and they had false hope in those riches. Here to close out the chapter, Paul is telling Timothy to address those who are already rich. Those who have acquired the material blessings of the day, Paul was teaching Timothy to teach them how to manage that in a Christ-like, God-honoring way. So you might be here today and say, well, Pastor, this doesn't apply to me. I am not rich. Well, I'm here to tell you, friends, that you today, sitting right here, comparatively speaking, you are richer than any single person who lived during this time that Timothy was pastoring this church. You have more resources, you have more opportunities, you have more luxuries, you have more extra spending cash, you have more opportunities to prepare for retirement. You are far richer than anybody, one person, living in that day. You are actually far richer than most of the population around the world. Even if you are one of the poorest, comparatively speaking, of your family and friends here in America, compared to people that live in very other places of our world, you are rich by God's standards. Amen? So this is a message for us, each and every one of us, whether we have lots of resources or minimal resources, God still expects us to be a good steward, a good disciple, and practicing the Lordship of Christ. Now the purpose for every preaching, every time a pastor, whether it's me or Pastor Eric or a pastor of a different church, or you're watching a YouTube channel, or you're listening to a, a podcast, the purpose for every preaching is to call people to live in Christ, to live like Christ, and to live for Christ. Amen? Amen? So obviously today, though we're preaching about money, the first and primary need that you have is to be in Christ. To be saved. Don't sit through a service today here at the Mission Church of Lexington. Whether you're on campus or online, whether you're inside or outside, whether it's a 9 a.m. service or the 11 a.m. service, don't leave this service today without being in Christ the way that you enter into Christ is by repenting of your sin and putting your faith in Jesus Christ. That you trust Him as your Lord and you begin to live for Him as your Savior. If you don't hear anything else today, that is your greatest need. The question is, are you in Christ? It's not whether you are religious. It's not whether you come to church. It's not whether you pay your bills or even give a tithe. The question today is, are you in Christ by faith? After you are in Christ by faith, then you are to live like Christ. That God begins to have a greater authority, a greater lordship, a greater reign in your life. Less of you and more of Him. Amen? That's every part of your life. The decisions you make, uh, the, the choices that you make, the relationships you build, the dreams that you have, the vocation you go in, the way you spend your money, the way you spend your time. These are all committed to God and you should be looking more like Christ each and every passing day, month, and year. And then lastly, every sermon is to help you to live for Christ. Amen? That we're dying to ourselves and living to Christ. That we're setting our agenda on the back burner and saying, God, I want your best done in my life. I'm willing to live for you because you died for me. But today, specifically, we are talking about how you are doing that with your financial well being and your means. Money management is a Christian thing to do. Familiar story about John D. Rockefeller. One of the richest men in the world, and for all practical purposes, his money was virtually limitless. 
At that time, there was nothing he could not do. There was no amount of money he could not earn. There wasn't anything that his finances could not afford him to be able to enjoy or pursue. Well, one interviewer asked him a probing question and said, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money will it take to be enough? In that famous and well-known and sad response given by Mr. Rockefeller was just a little bit more. That was the response about the richest man in the world at that time. He just needed a little bit more. So whether you have millions of dollars, thousands of dollars, or tens of dollars that you have in your possession, if you are a lover of money more than a lover of God, enough will never be enough. You always say, I need just a, a little bit more. You always have a the sin of comparison, looking at someone else and, well, I wish I had a house like that. Wish I had a car like that. Wish I had a, uh, a retirement portfolio like that. Wish I had a bank account like that. If we have the sin of comparison, which we preached about two weeks ago, we will never be satisfied, we'll never be content, and we'll always have a desire for just a little bit more. And in my humble but accurate opinion, here is one reason why those who have minimal resources have an advantage over those who have a lot of resources, because those who have a little bit of resources, they have the, the false assumption that they had just a little bit more more, then they'll feel safe, then they'll feel secure, then they'll be happy, then they'll be able to enjoy life. But those who have all those things, they realize that once you get that, you're still not satisfied, you're still not content, that life still has a void in it, and life will always have a void in it if you try to live it without God. Amen? There's a void inside all of us that money can never fill, that only the Messiah can fill. There's a void inside of us that no toy that we could have could ever make us content. Only in a vibrant relationship with Christ can do that. There are two basic views of wealth. You either view it as something that you own and get to do what you want with, or you look at it as something that God owns that He entrusts to you to do what He wills with. Amen? This is a matter of getting our ownership and our stewardship in the right order. We do not own anything as a believer in Christ. God owns it all. But He entrusts it to you to use as a steward or as a manager. And a steward is a servant. And we must always remind ourselves that servants do not spend time asking, what is it that I want? They spend all of their time and energy and focus saying, what does the master want? Amen? That should be what you are asking yourself in every facet of your life, but including your bank account, including your checkbook. It's not what I want, but what does my master want? We want to make sure that we realize that we are stewards, and stewards have no rights, only responsibilities. Hey, I'll say that again because it's so good. Amen. We as Christians in every part of our life, including our finances, to get this thing right about managing money as a Christian thing to do, we must remember that we do not have rights. We have responsibilities to God. As most Christians... If you ask this question, they'll begin to squirm in their seat. The, convi the conviction will begin to rise. The guilt, the shame, the embarrassment will begin to creep in. But the question for us today is this. What does God think of the way you handle your finances? I ask myself the question today. I challenge you to ask yourself today as we're learning these principles, basic, practical to principles from God's Word, ask yourself today, what is God's evaluation of how you manage your money today? Point number one in your outline. First things first, give to God first. Friends, this is where it all begins. Putting God first is the primary thing we must do. As Christians, our first financial priority just as is the case for every area of our life 
should be God and His work. Amen? That God being glorified in the work of winning people to Christ, serving God through the local church, serving God in evangelism and missions, going and giving the purposes of God, the expansion of the kingdom is why we exist. We are not here just to make this life fun for ourselves. We're not here just to make a reputation for ourselves. God is not that concerned with our happiness. He's concerned with our holiness. God is concerned with our character more than our comfort. God wants us as believers in Christ to be willing to make sacrifices, to say no to ourselves for the good of God. God wants us to live a sacrificial, generous life that includes every part of our life, but it certainly involves our finances. The issue of managing all of our gifts, including our finances, is of great importance to God. Now the sad statistics tell us that the average Christian, the average Christian is sitting inside of good local churches that have the Word of God preached to them, that probably already know more truth than they're applying. The average Christian gives 2% to kingdom purposes. They give 2% of their resources to God through the local church for the ministry of the gospel and for missions and for the expansion of winning the lost and building the saved. 2% most Christians give. 35% research tells us of believers in Christ, those who have been blood-bought, born again, members oftentimes of local churches, 35% give absolutely nothing. They come, they're blessed, they're served, they get involved in some way of attendance, but they look at church more as a consumer product. They say, well, if I can get what I'm getting for free, that's a good deal for me. Amen. That's the way they look at it, but the part of walking with Jesus and being involved in a local church is not what I can get out of it. But what can I contribute to it? Amen. That's the goal for serving God. Now, whether it's 2% or 0% or 5% that somebody gives, remember, God is not in need of your finances. He does not care about He's the cattle on a thousand hills. He can do whatever He wants to do with whatever resources He wants, but He wants your heart. Understand that if you are not giving the way God would want you to give, if you're not managing your money the way God wants you to manage, you do not have a money problem. You have a master problem. You do not have a cash problem. You have a Christ problem. That there's a disconnect between your heart because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Bible says, Jesus says, you cannot love God and money. It's a choice and a decision and a commitment that we have to make. Now, a biblical principle is the principle of the tithe. Proverbs 3 9 says this Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So, God says for us to give the first fruits of all of our material blessings, all of our salary, all of our income. He doesn't say leave the leftovers to Him. He says give the first fruits. I can tell you this is one of the spiritual mysteries of God's Word. We'll never, looking on paper, feel like we have the financial margin to tithe the first 10%. It'll never look like it matches up. It just won't. But I can tell you this, that based on the authority of God's Word and personal experience, when you are faithful with your tithes, the first 10%, before anything else of your gross income, you cannot outgive God. God will be a debtor to no man. God will provide in, in unique ways. Not always financially. I can tell you that if you give 10%, you may not have the same amount as someone who hoards it all for themselves in your checking account or your retirement portfolio, but you expect God's blessings in other areas and other ways of your life. I often say that 
90 cents with God's blessing will go further than a dollar without it. Amen? That's just the way God works. Reminds me of a man who was lamenting to his pastor that he just could not tithe, that his salary was such a, a robust salary that it was hard for him to tithe. He just could not give it away. And, and he said, if I gave it away, that I would not be able to pay all my expenses and all my bills. I'm going to lose everything. I'm not going to be able to pay my utilities and my mortgage and my car payments and all these other things that are so near and dear to me. Well, the pastor said, well, guess what? I will make up the difference if you are faithful for three months, giving your time to the work of the Lord. You're trusting that, that, that I will provide the difference if it, you come up short. And the man thought for a moment and said, oh, I can do that. If you'll pay the difference, if I come up short, I can do that. And that the pastor calmly and quietly said, isn't it strange that if I make a promise to provide for your needs, a man of such minimal resources, you would trust me to make up the difference, but you won't trust God who owns everything. The Bible says in Psalm 24, it says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That God has the resources available for us, but He's trusting us to be faithful to Him. Amen? Amen. If we're selfish, He's not going to step in. He's going to say, okay, my son, my daughter, have it your way. Fight that battle. Just squeak along. You know, everything's stressful for you. Bank account's tight. You have it your way if that's what you want. There's something better that God has in store for you. Trust God with the first fruits, not the leftovers. Then that familiar passage in Malachi, or as my wife says, Malachi, the Italian prophet, in verses uh, 10 of chapter 3 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me on this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Hey, that passage is either true or it's not. That's either in the Bible or it's not. You either believe it and obey it or you disbelieve and disobey it. It says that we are to bring our tithes. You say, what is a tithe? It's 10% of your income to where? The storehouse, the local church. For what purpose? So there's resources in the church to expand the kingdom, to serve others, to glorify God. And if you do so, there's a direct correlation with a blessing on your life. The scripture says it. We don't tithe, we don't give so that God will bless us. We tithe and give because He has already blessed us. But then when you're faithful to that, then you can be assured according to God's promises that He will continue to bless you. You say, well, pastor, those are all Old Testament examples. Well, let me give you a New Testament one. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus is giving that scathing rebuke of those religious leaders. He says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Hypocrite is those who uh, say they, uh, they're, they're, they're Ford salesmen, but they drive a Chevy around, right? Say one thing, do something else. For you pay tithe, you give your tithe, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Those you ought to have done without leaving the other undone. So the reason why it's not codified as much in the New Testament was this was in the ethos of those first century Christians. They knew as a Jewish mindset that God deserved not just a 10%. He owned all of it. Amen. And giving the 10% was just a sign of obedience back to Him. So Paul or Jesus was saying here to the Pharisees, hey, you give to be seen by man. But you've left out the deeper truths of justice, mercy, and faith. He said you should develop those other qualities of being a Christ follower, but don't stop doing the other things. Amen? I can tell you that if you just go through the motions of giving 10%, but it's not an act of worship that you have, it's not pleasing to God. But if you give because you're joyfully, sacrificially, as an act of worship, 
giving to God that's pleasing and honoring to Him and good for you. You may hear me each and every Sunday when it's time for our tithes and our offerings. I say it's now time to worship through stewardship. It's not something we tag on the end. It's not your cost for admittance. It's not something that we have to do just to have a religious protocol to walk through. Giving to God is an act of worship. It's part of your spiritual worship to the Lord. It's something that you do because you want to be obedient to God. You want to glorify Him. And you want to be a part of the kingdom adventure that God has for you. A man had a horrible dream one night. He said, the Lord took my Sunday offering and multiplied it by 10%. And this became my weekly income that I had to live upon. In no time, I lost everything. I mean, who in the world can live on $50 a week? <laughs> the Lord multiplied your offering by 10%. How would you and how would I fare? Money and material wealth, listen church family, is designed by God to be a trust, a test, a tool, and a testimony. But the devil likes to use it as a trap. I think that'll be my motivation Monday post for this Monday. Amen. The money that God has given us by God's design is to be a trust in our life. Again, that's the reminder that God has entrusted it to us. It's not ours. It's God's. The way we view our money says a lot about our spiritual mindset. It's a trust. It's also a test. Are you going to allow that money and the love thereof to push you away from God? Or are you going to allow that to be a test that drives you to God? That's the test of money. It's also a tool. The money is a terrible, as I said, master, but it's a great servant. We all have to have money. Without money, you would not put gas in the tank of your vehicle. You would not be able to go to lunch today after service. You would not be able to pay your rent or your mortgage. Money is part of our human experience, but it is a tool to be used, not something to be loved, not something to be worshipped. We must have the right view of material possessions. And lastly, God wants to use it as a testimony. They, the way that you are gracious and generous with your finances can be a testimony to a watching world. Every part of our life as a believer, unbeliever should look at and say, I don't get it. That doesn't make sense to me. That's not a natural way to do life. And you say, exactly. It's not natural. It's supernatural. I'm living for an authority higher than what this earth says. The world system says, make all you can, can all you make, set on the lid, spoil the rest, right? Get all you can for yourself, hoard it up, don't want anybody else to get an advantage, right? That you want to have me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. Well, God says we're to live otherworldly. That we have to be in this world, but not of this world. That we know that finances and paying bills is part of our human experience, but we do it with a higher purpose and a higher vision. But I can tell you the devil wants to use it as a trap. He wants to take finances, material things. He wants to bond it to you. He wants to put his hooks in you. He wants to use that to distract you, to get you to do various and sundry sins and wrong mindsets. And he doesn't mind what you worship or how you worship as long as you don't worship the true and living God. The devil rejoices when human beings Love money, serve money, live for money, idolize money because it becomes a trap in our lives. Number two, here's a couple practical things for you to take home with you today. After you give God the first, number two, set aside funds for strategic savings. Set aside funds for strategic savings. Saving money is a godly thing to do. You know, we're not putting our hope and our trust in the money, but we're living wisely. The book of Proverbs is replete with this principle. It tells us to, to go to, you know, go to the ant, you sluggard, and consider its ways. 
<laughs> you know, the ant works hard to build up a reserve so when the winter months comes in, they don't have to depend on someone else to take care of them. They have a little bit of a safety net, a little security net to get them through the lean times. It's exactly what Joseph what taught uh, Pharaoh to do in the years of plenty to prepare for the years of famine, right? It's a biblical principle to prepare for the uncertain future. Now, never to replace God. God is always our primary source of sense of security and safety. But God gives us wisdom, or I say sanctified common sense, to prepare for what is unknown. We want to save money to make purchases, not depending upon debt. Let me say that louder for the people in the back and for the front and for outside and on the internet here, right? Hey, don't live by debt. Debt can be debilitating. There are some things that going into debt for may have some wisdom strategically, Something that's going to gain you uh, uh, advantage, get a home, purchasing a home, something that's going to increase in value. It's very unwise and a poor steward to use debt to buy perishable things. That if you cannot save up the money to buy, and I even put a vehicle in this category. Don't want to meddle too much, right? I can tell you, as soon as you buy your vehicle, drive it off the lot, it depreciates. Home increases, almost everything else decreases. Save up the money. You say, well, I can't buy the $30,000 vehicle I want. Okay, well, buy the $6,000 one and save the money, right? Yeah. Be wise. Delayed gratification is a sign of maturity. Don't depend upon debt. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 7, write this down the borrower is servant to the lender. I can tell you that if you have a bunch of debt in your life, it is hindering you. It's handicapping you. It's preventing you from being generous to give to others. It's preventing you from being generous to give your tithes and your offerings. It's preventing you from taking that mission trip. It's preventing you from taking that different job. You're stuck in the job you have because you're slave to the paycheck. But there's really something else that pays less, but it's your passion. But you can't do it because you've got to pay your bills for all the toys that you bought over time. Then now you have to work all the time to pay for it. You never get to enjoy them, right? Don't live with debt. The Bible clear about this. The Bible never says that debt's a sin, but it does say it's stupid. <laughs> doesn't say it's a sin, but it does say it is unwise. That it's just an unwise thing to do. It's a decision you have to make for yourself, but I can tell you it's a slippery slope that is not a wise strategic thing to do with your savings. Savings is also an emergency fund for you. It is personal self-insurance. Hey, whenever you have an emergency fund, if you do the Dave Ramsey principle, right? You got a thousand dollars. The first thing you do, here's the here's the baby steps. Dave Ramsey, okay? I can't take this. Dave Ramsey created this is basic stuff. Thousand dollars in your savings for emergency fund. You never know when your tires going to pop, right? You never know whenever your refrigerator is going to go out. You never know when uncertain things happen. Don't live so paycheck to paycheck that there's so much stress and anxiety about the uncertain things that come up. A thousand dollars that won't do everything, but it'll do something. Give you a little bit of sense of security. Not in God, not in the money, but in God and the wisdom He's given you. Step number two. Get rid of all of your debt, except maybe your mortgage. So how in the world can I do that? Dave Ramsey teaches, right? The debt snowball. Maximize paying everything, getting the lowest debt. When you're done paying that lowest debt, take that amount and roll to the next one, roll to the next one, roll to the next one. Don't worry about the amount of, of rate, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the rate on the card there. What is interest rate? Just take the smallest one. You pay it off. Guess what? You're going to get excited. It's going to build momentum. You're going to feel some freedom from that. And you're going to have that uh, roll to the next one, roll to the next one. Before long, you'll be debt free. That's a good feeling. Number three, step number three, have yourselves six months to 12 months of living expense. You never know when your job will be lost. You never know when someone, you might get laid off from work. You might get injured. 
Business might go out of business. Who knows what happens? Having six to twelve months. Again, that's not an extreme amount. You're not just trying to keep score. I want I want a million dollars in the bank account. Just six to twelve months. So if something were to happen unforeseen, you'd be able to be self-insured. After that, you want to you want to then look at preparing your children for college. If you have children, college is expensive. Not all people should go to college. There's other options. There's vocational schools. Man, go be a mechanic. Go be a carpenter. Go work in a, a factory that's got a solid foundation. Not everybody's designed for college, and that is okay. Go, in, go into the military. Some people just have that in their DNA. That they are just a they're they're a warrior by instinct. Go in the middle. Those are all good things. All things that honor God. You don't have to go to college and waste a bunch of money on a degree you'll never use that doesn't open up any door for you. It's, it is okay. After that, then you want to pay off your mortgage. Somebody says, well, don't pay off your mortgage, it's a tax write-off. That's foolishness, friends. I can tell you, how nice is it not to have $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 a month to pay on a mortgage? Now you can use that to invest in things, right? Amen. Hey, make sure you are giving 15, about 15% 15 to your retirement. Contribute to a retirement. And the last thing, step number seven, is the one that's really exciting. That's whenever you can just build wealth, and not for your glory, but for kingdom purposes. God doesn't enlarge your, your income and enlarge your financial standing to increase your standard of living, but to increase your standard of giving. Find a, a nice, reasonable lifestyle to live on. Say, when we can live on that and everything above this, we're going to give to the work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Think of how many missionaries you can support. Think of how many uh, church buildings you can build here at the Mission Church of Lexington. <laughs> things you can do. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And then lastly, it says, give like, like no one else. Because you, you don't have that hindrance. It's a good thing. Godly thing. Strategic savings. Save for retirement, as I said. And what I mean by that is not what a man said. My wife and I, we are aggressively preparing for retirement. And by that meaning, we, we play the lottery three to five times a week. That is, that is not how you prepare for retirement. Retirement. Amen. Amen. Number three. Spend the rest on what you need. Spend the rest on what you need. Hey, give 10% your tithes. God does that so that we can check our faithfulness to Him. Or we're going to do what God says, the first 10%. Then you should have some offerings. Love offerings above and beyond. Some things that are special to you. It might be a building fund. It might be a missionary you like. You might give to Caleb because it blesses you. There might be some other way that you like to give to one of our missionaries. Maybe you just love Amy for Africa. You love Jungle Jim. You like one of them. And you want to give a little extra to them. Those things check your sensitivity to God. Hey, my money belongs to you, Lord. You leave me what you want me to do and I want to do it. Then you, sit, then you invest and you save some. And then God wants you to use the rest of it as a tool. God is not trying to take away all your fun. God is okay with you taking a vacation. God doesn't mind if you have a nice little toy here or there. God doesn't mind if you have a nice vehicle or a nice truck. As long as those things don't have you. Amen? Albert Schweitzer said this, If you have something you can't live without, you don't own it, it owns you. God doesn't mind if you have things, as long as those things do not have you. Reminds me of a man who, uh, who was getting out of his Beamer, brand new Beamer, beautiful car. He got out in this junky old truck, sideswiping. <laughs> Took the door off the hinges, man. It was down the road. The cop rolled up, and all you could hear was a man saying over and over, my, my Beamer, my Beamer, my Beamer. The cop said, I don't think you really need to be worried about your Beamer. When that door got taken off, your arm went with it. <laughs> There's a door down the street with your arm attached to it. The guy thought for a minute and said, My Rolex, my Rolex. <laughs> the only cure for materialism is generous living. And here's where the budget comes into play. Hey, a budget, again, is a wise thing to do. The concept, is, the Bible never says budget your money, but the concept, the truth is in the Bible. 
Proverbs says in Proverbs 27, 23, be careful to know the state of your flock. And I don't think anybody here is a shepherd. Right? We, but in that day and time, the, the sheep, that was your livelihood, right? He's saying, be wise to know the state of your livelihood. The principle applies to us. Be wise and be aware of what you're in. Have a budget. Make a budget. What do you say a budget is? Well, that's my income and my outgo. What's the difference? Right? And I can tell you this. If your income, if your outgo, I should say, exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. Right? <laughs> you got to make sure that you are spending less than you make. Have a plan. That's what a budget is. I say our church is not a church budget. It's a spending plan. We're, 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 we're saying this is how we want to spend the resources that God's given us. It should be the same for our homes as well. Here's how we want to spend the money so we know where our money is going instead of wondering where it went, right? you got to know what you owe, know what your values are. You put in that, the very first line item should be my 10% to God. Then you go through your, your line items of here, my, my mortgage, my utilities, my things. Here's the nice things. Here's what, you know, know where your money's going. Have an intentional strategy and a plan. Hey, spend the money, the rest of what you need. Number four, if you are married, always discuss finances as a couple. This is something else God uses in our marriages. The devil uses it as well. One of the highest points of contention between marriages. One of the highest reasons for divorce is financial disagreements, problems financially, arguments financially. But God wants to use that same catalyst to draw couples together, not push them away. That we know that we marry someone who's usually different than us, right? And almost every marriage is one spender and one saver. Yeah. Now that's a good thing. Don't don't resist that. If you're both spenders, guess what? You'd be broke. <laughs> if you're both savers, guess what? Life would be boring and dull and bland. Yeah. God brings you together, but that forces you to communicate. Mm -hmm. And that's something that God is pleased with. God wants two to become one. The more marriages I have done over the years, I've seen the trend happening. Instead of them becoming one in all areas, including their finances, they develop, let's just have our own separate lives financially. And I can understand the earthly wisdom of that. I can. I've seen the nightmares of it. I can understand why some people do it, but I can tell you, when Scripture says two becomes one, it doesn't make an exception for our finances. It forces us as a couple to work together, to be on the same page, to determine priorities, determine dreams and objectives. It causes us to have conflict resolution. I disagree. You got to have a plan. Anything we buy that's above 100 bucks, 50 bucks, 1,000 bucks, a million bucks, whatever your baker allows you, we need to talk about it, right? Here's the budget. Let's live on it. So I can tell you, whenever there's situations where you find in a relationship where someone is unfaithful with finances, it has the same psychological impact in many ways as someone who's unfaithful sexually. I've been violated. My trust has been depleted. I thought we had an agreement. Hey, because of your choices, now we have to sell this or give up that. Or we can't send our kids here because you did this. And now all that animosity and that bitterness and that trust gets eroded. I mean, the, it's, a, it's, it's different. Obviously, this sin of being faithfully, unfaithful sexually is, I mean, there, that is, there's no pain really deeper than that. But the concept, the psychological impact is similar when a, one spouse is, is unwise, untruthful, deceptive about their financial spending. Men, husbands, and wives need to discuss. Not one controlling and one being passive. Both should be engaged. Lying on his deathbed, the rich but miserly old man called his long-suffering wife. I want to take all my money with me. I don't want to leave you anything. <laughs> so, so promise me that you'll put all those resources in my casket. After the man died, the widow attended the memorial service and with her best friend. Just before the undertaker closed the coffin, she placed in a small metal box inside. 
Her friend looked at her in horror. Surely, she said, you didn't put that money in there. She said, the wife, I didn't promise him I would, the widow said. So I got all of the finances together, deposited every penny into my account, wrote him a check. If he can cash it, he can spend it. <laughs> A little, little jingle that I like to use. Uh, theirs was a perfect marriage. Theirs was a perfect marriage. Other than one fatal flaw. He was quick on the deposit, but she was quicker on the withdrawal. <laughs> hey, leave it this thought. Whatever you want God to bless, your marriage, your work, your finances, put him first. Whatever you want Him to bless, put Him first. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let's pray.